You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're talking about the 1982 3D movie, Parasite. Here we go. Yeah, we get into Parasite, which I have a feeling we may not th- talk that long about. No, actually, I have some notes on it. It actually did help me, actually helped explain a lot about Charles Band that I didn't know before. So I've been trying to watch more of his movies to get a kind of a better understanding. Like, you know, about Lloyd Kaufman, Troma, and Corman. Charles Band has always been a blind spot for me. And I think watching some of these films after we watched uh, Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, and then doing research for that, this actually helped connect a few dots. Well, Parasite is kind of like a proto Jared Sin because that's a 3D movie done by Band as well. So Absolutely. This, oh, yeah. We're going to get into it, Nick. missing piece for that. <laughs> oh, we're going to get into it, Nick. And everyone's listening because they're listening to the Fan to Fan podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Bernie Gonzalez, with me today, co host extraordinaire, Pete Charbonneau. We have an amazing guest on, reoccurring <laughs> guest that we always invite back for really good conversations. That's Nick Dyack. Pete, first time you ever saw the movie we are going to talk about, correct? Well, Bernie, uh, I've seen it twice now in three months, and I'm still not quite sure I remember much of anything about it. Nick, is this the first time you've seen this movie? We're we're talking about Parasite, the 1982 movie, not the Academy Award winning 2019 film, right? That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll see you guys. I watched the wrong Parasite. (laughs) You are about to witness the future. Be warned. It is a shocking sight. 3D, the ultimate sensation of visual art, now creates the newest, most terrifying form of fear, Parasite. That thing on your stomach. A new strain of Parasite. When it reproduces, it will cast millions of microscopic spores into the air. Just move your legs towards me real slow. Real slow. Experience the living breathing, terrifying vision of modern 3D. Parasite. You have only seen the preview. In 3D, you will live the film. Parasite. The first futuristic monster movie in 3D. Parasite. So there was a phase back in the 2000s, I guess I'm still in it, where I was going through all the Charles Band Empire and full moon films, and I picked up a copy of Parasite. I rewatched it this weekend for this podcast, and it seemed very foreign to me. I'm like, did I actually see this? Was this a fever dream or not? So either I watched it once back in the 2000s, because I have an autographed copy. I overtly went out and bought this movie and took it to a convention to get the guy from Police Academy to sign this film. And, and, he- and if anyone has, has listened to our podcast before when Nick has been on, Usually, if, whatever the subject is, Nick has a signed copy of it <laughs> that you can't see because you're listening to a podcast, but rest assured, he has it on hand to show us, and, and he comes through yet again, so That's sorry right. to interrupt, Nick. Please, please continue. So, I've either seen it twice, once back then and once this weekend, or, uh, you know, I had some memento action going on, and it just erased time its memory, and I watched it for the first time this weekend, Parasite. <laughs> Totally understandable, Nick, because I had to put this together because I saw this for the first time when uh, Pete, you and I were starting to put together, formulate the conversation to talk about 3D movies, you know, that mm-hmm. something that we both grew up with, that we love. We were kind of looking back at it with nostalgic glasses on, right? Let alone 3D glasses. And <laughs> this this kind of came up in the conversation with uh, movies like Coming At You that neither of us have seen, but let us know that. There were movies that started the 80s trend of 3D movies before Jaws 3D or Amityville or or any of those other 3D movies that certainly were more popular than Parasite 3D. But (laughs) none of us knew that we were watching the first futuristic monster movie in 3D, a post-apocalyptic movie, one of Demi Moore's first movie roles roles from the writer of Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, the cinematographer also of Metal Storm. Featuring creature work from an Oscar nominee in Lance Anderson, who was nominated for Cinderella Man, and also Stan Winston, who did Terminator the Thing, Predator, Jurassic Park, Aliens, and featuring, of course, an 80s Lamborghini Countach, all produced by Erwin Yablonz, the producer behind the classic 1978 Halloween. That's Parasite 3D. That is quite a still wrong. How could you go wrong? 100%. 
All right. So, Nick, I'm going to give your intro now, now that we've gotten folks in, hopefully <laughs> lulled them into a false sense of security, talking about this uh, this 80s, maybe not so classic, but it's a classic in my heart. Uh, Nick Dyack, thank you for joining us. Folks can find you at nickdyack.com, essays, blog, links to your social media. You are a writer, pop scholar, convention speaker, podcaster with various areas of interest and expertise, including Peplum, so think like sword and sandal media. Pete and I have had the pleasure of talking to Nick about movies like Conan and other sword and sandal movies of the 80s, especially. Uh, Death Stalker 2 comes to mind. Uh, Nick also likes Italian Euro spy cinema, exploitation cinema, tiki cocktails, and along with Michelle Brittany, who's also been gracious enough to show, join us on the podcast, they are co-hosts of the HP Lovecast podcast dedicated to the works inspired by Lovecraft. So Nick, thanks for joining me and Pete for a conversation about this uh, not-so-80s classic Parasite. I should be thanking y'all. I'm always so gracious to be on, but it's Parasite. What have you done? <laughs> we gave you no a time. reason to watch the movie. I, you know, re watching it or watching it for the first time, it made me appreciate a different movie a lot more. That A movie I've already held in super high regard, but that's the Deadly Spawn. Sure. This is like Deadly Spawn light. But anyway, like you said, there's a lot of firsts in this film and a lot of how could this have gone wrong because... I shouldn't say wrong. It's not terrible. I I know one of the uh the not taglines, but trivia. Of this is a uh, Demi Moore was on what James Corden show and said this is the worst film I've been in. I'm like, you see nothing but trouble, right? Uh, that's that's your worst film. <laughs> Parasite's not even that bad. Been in so many brilliant movies: Ghost, GI Jane, A Few Good Men. What's the worst movie you've ever been in? <laughs> Actually, that one is easy, um, and I'm so happy that I have the answer to this one. It's Parasite in 3D. Parasite in 3D. Did you miss that one? Too? I missed it. <laughs> this is a movie that has, I think, great ideas. Like, like I said earlier, Bernie, the idea of post-apocalyptic film with a monster. You didn't really have those. I mean, the... Most post-apocalyptic films at the time, you know, yeah, mutants maybe. And it feels like a cool movie. It's basically a bounty hunter type film. A guy is pursuing another guy who has, a, a, you know, parasite bioweapons on him. It has kind of a Phantasm three vibe to it where it's kind of a, you know, decayed America, you know, very small town, very Wild West as well. And it looks cool. And again, the the parasite itself, Stan Winston, the, the, the parasite itself looks really cool. It's just that, there's so much nothing that they do with it. Come on, this is Charles Bain who gave us Trancers and Puppet Master, a king of 80s exploitation. He should be exploiting and giving us the goods. And why? Why didn't he? <laughs> hey, so you, you saw this twice in about three weeks. Uh, what are what are some of your uh, initial impressions? I, I wish I could give you some, Bernie. Uh, like I said, I, I watched like when we were started to talk about the the eighties three D craze. I you know I went down my own personal rabbit hole. I don't know if it's luck or just the the time that I was born. And I you know I was fortunate <laughs> enough to see Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, and Metal Storm: The Destruction of Jared Sin and Jaws three D in the theater as a, as a kid. So to go back and kind of revisit these was was fun uh, for the most part. I was like, all right, well, Paris, I, you know, that I, I certainly remember the the VHS box in my local video store that was it was fairly memorable. You had like this kind of almost translucent creature with almost kind of like glass, super sharp teeth on it. So definitely intrigued. And so I, I went into this the first time thinking I'm like, all right, well, this should be, you know, hopefully entertaining. And just I had to watch it again because I, I completely forgot what I had watched the first time. And then watching it again a second time. I didn't remember all that much more of it. And so I actually went to watch it a third time last week. <laughs> and it's not on Tubi anymore. And I'm like, uh, I can't even bring myself to pay 99 cents on Prime to watch the kids. <laughs> I did not revisit it a third time. But I think to Nick's point, it's it's really kind of forgettable. I think there's some good ideas there. There's there, that mashup monster movie, post-apocalyptic, you know, the bit of the Western uh, tinged to it. Maybe it's a case of too much going on and, and because, you know, budgetary reasons or whatever, it just doesn't come together. But yeah, and I, you know, I don't like to, to just flat out trash, you know, movies even of the, you know, the low budget kind, because I think as we've talked about many times, it, you know, it, I have a great appreciation for people that don't have the money to kind of still put something out into the world. But to me, this was just really forgettable. What about you, Bernie? 
it is forgettable, but I think maybe the asterisk behind that is it feels forgettable considering the movies that we've been talking about recently between Chud and Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, compared to some of those movies. Maybe that's where Parasite kind of gets the short shrift. We saw other 3D movies uh, like Treasure of the Four Crowns, Pete, where it was basically gimmick the movie. Like it was less of a movie and more of a 3D spectacle, but it was still somewhat entertaining because it was still a little bit of a riff off Raiders. It's still canon films. And I think now having watched the Transer series, Castle Freak and a few other Charles Band films, like you were saying, Nick, there's a way where it kind of checks all the boxes of a movie that should be more memorable. But I do think the one thing that I appreciated from this movie is it helped me understand more about Charles Band. And I think doing the research on how we got to Parasite, which I definitely want to share with you guys, I think that's where the appreciation came in. This movie, like coming at you, started the craze, which more as like an artifact, not necessarily as entertainment, was interesting. And I think, you know, one of the things that was not in its favor, the, the quality of the print that I watched it on on mm. Tubi. So it was, it's not it's not the best quality. I, I, I did a little research and it, it sounds like there's a much better version. Nick, you may even have a, a much better cleaned up version. So I think that kind of lent itself. Sometimes that can give it maybe like a bit of a gritty feel to it. To me, sure. it was just mm -hmm. it did not enhance it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you have some uh, some band aids that uh, you're going <laughs> to I do. Uh, share I'll, with us. This is some some stuff that I think you guys may know, but again, this was helpful to me to provide some context, some perspective for Parasite 3D. Albert Band is Charles Band's dad. Mm -hmm. Albert is working in uh, in in Hollywood in the industry. He's in Europe working on European productions, and Charles Band is on the set with his dad since like as early as nine. From some of the interviews that I saw, then Albert takes the family, including Charles moves to L.A. somewhere in the 1960s. And at that point, Charles produces, um, he directs his first movie in 1975 called Mansion of the Doomed. And if you saw the poster, kind of lives up to the title. Looks like a low B, maybe C grade horror movie. But then he also produces Laser, Bl Laser Blast in 1978. And I know that movie from Mystery Science Theater 3000. It, it does have now in hindsight some Charles Band elements regarding the production. Laser Blast had a lot of writing the coattails of the Star Wars craze on a lower budget, right? During that production, Roddy McDowell is an actor on Laser Blast. Charles Band and Roddy McDowell become friends. McDowell shares that it's kind of commonplace that folks in the industry, actors, directors, they go to the studio and they get copies for viewing. Hey, I'm going to have a bunch of buddies over on Friday and we're going to watch a copy of King Kong or Gone with the Wind. However, McDowell has a friend who's now gotten into the whole video cassette industry and is making copies of movies. So they get a good print from, I think it's Paramount that releases Gone with the Wind and they make a copy of that. And now they have it on, it's like a, a different kind of video cassette than we grew up with. And it seems like they had like a 60 minute limit. So something like Gone with the Wind was probably on like two or three cassettes. So Band is seeing that while at the same time, he's seeing Magnetic Video that is the first company that I was able to find that licenses 20 films from Fox, all movies that were pre-1972, to release in the home video market. So he's seeing this company by an entrepreneur, a pioneer in this industry, who's like, hey, I think we can make money on home video. Fox is kind of being a little less risky by giving us movies that are not present day movies. Maybe they can make some extra money on those. First time it's ever happened. Band likes that idea. His buddy Roddy McDowell's like, hey, we watch movies at home. This is kind of cool. Charles Band grew up in the industry. So that's what, again, this is why this was interesting to me because like you can kind of see this confluence of events working on a production with Roddy McDowell who exposes him to this pioneering uh, technology. Band likes the idea. Betamax and VHS are becoming super popular in the early 80s, stuff that we grew up with. Movie, stu movie studios are starting to be willing to license their movies. And then Charles Band's first success is in creating a uh, media home entertainment, and they released 1978's Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, and that's kind of what really ramps him up. He made his, you know, his money from being one of the first video uh, home video pioneers. That's all 1978. He also opens up two video stores in California called Wizard Video. So Charles Band gets media going. He's working a producer. Your, uh, your wind, your blondes who produces Parasite and he brings in your blondes. Uh, your blondes basically does a hostile takeover and pushes out band out of media home entertainment. 
So a band who's now literally like one of the first people I found that started in the home video market gets screwed out of his company. I guess screwed is is relative because he got like 400000 for his portion. But Yablon winds, winds up selling the company for like $10 million. But nevertheless, band seem, being somewhat prophetic here is like, hey, I think I did it before. I'll do it again. He creates Wizard Home Video named after the two video stores that he had before. And then he releases Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I Spit on Your Grave, a bunch of European movies, including Fulci Zombie. He's starting to really put like inventory on the shelves of video stores. And that was even before when we had like grocery stores and gas stations, right? That had movies. He was supplying the demand. That's all happening. He also adapted through Wizard Video, <laughs> Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the Atari 2600. Because he felt there was like this opportunity to take advantage of media and movies and put it all together. Didn't work out for him, but kind of, again, prophetic because he's like, well, if we have movie footage, maybe we can put that in video games. So he's obviously pioneering, looking at different media types, different industries. Then it's 1981, but boom, coming at you comes out in 3D. And he's like, I'm going to ride that trend. And then Parasite comes into play because he's like, why not make a movie that does this? But he also is now starting in this burgeoning home video market. I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting how all these roads kind of collide and get us to this movie that, yes, forgettable, but then actually kind of really indirectly leads to what we know now Charles Band to be is the guy who made Full Moon and produced or directed like 300 plus movies. Remember, you can find the Fan to Fan podcast at www.fanpodcast.com. Facebook, just search Fan to Fan podcast. That's F-A-N, the number two, F-A-N. On Instagram, at Fan to Fan podcast. Or on Twitter, at Fan to Fan podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so send a message and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. And now, on with the show. There is a... Another thing going on at the, the same time, this has crossover for the bands because, you know, his dad, Albert Mann, you know, uh, was Italian filmmaker. He actually, he made Pat Blum, he made a lot of other stuff and, you know, Charles Band was exposed to all that and everything. But in the 70s, the Italian market for movies kind of took a, a crash because television was finally coming into play. So what it used to be was, Back in the the golden age of movies for Italy, late fifties, sixties, and that you know they were cranking all this genre film because that was your TV. You would go to the cinema. It didn't matter what was playing. They'd have all this genre film from spaghetti western, peplum, jowls, whatever, and that was your community space. That's what you watched and everything. But by the seventies, people finally had television, and that just kind of killed that market. But, you know, the Italians were still doing their kind of knockoff movies and everything. So Jaws would come out. They would make all the Jaws knockoffs. Uh, Dirty Harry would come out. You'd make all the police procedural films come out. But, you know, a certain little film called Mad Max came out. And, of course, the Italians came out with all these post-apocalyptic derivatives, such as, you know, uh, 1990 Escape from Bronx and New Warriors and stuff like that, which all kind of came out at the same time as Parasite did. And it's funny because... I don't ever really consider Full Moon and Empire like Italian, -y, even though there's that hmm. there's that DNA of it. They operated very much like the Italian stuff of the period. But when the cinema market kind of crashed in Italy, they still were making genre films, although not as much. But because everyone had TVs now, now you had the video market, and so you can cr still creak out your Jaws knockoffs, your Mad Max knockoffs. Your Emmanuel knockoffs mm -hmm. and uh, distribute them. And then who'd you have uh, on the, the side of the Atlantic? You had Wizard Video, whatnot, taking those Italian imports and re releasing them through media and um, Wizard Video and stuff. So you could still go to like Full Moon Direct and see like old 80s Italian films that they had initial distribution rights uh, still being sold through them and whatnot. So it's kind of two not parallel lines of history but they keep doing this they keep crossing over and everything and i'm glad you brought up the international thing nick yeah because he directs parasite right he directs metal storm the destruction of jared sin one of pete's favorites obviously you <laughs> saw it in the theater but the box office on those both of those movies were so disappointing and he realized that the guy who screwed him over erwin yablons from media from that company was making more money off of it and movies that he directed, wrote, or, or helped on the production of 
were making more money on foreign markets. He wasn't seeing the return of it. After doing those movies, then he's like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do this on my own. And he's inspired by Troma and, and, and Corman and Cannon trying to pre-sell stuff, but they're doing it in a way that's kind of intelligent. We'll make a really good poster and say that it stars maybe this actor, who knows, and it'll have a catchy title or at least a catchy title enough for us to sell it in Italy, in Spain, in different markets. We'll make a shit ton of money without even shooting one frame. And then based on the money we get, all right, guys, well, we collected $3 million. What are we going to do? Well, let's go make a million dollar movie because then we can make a movie on a mill, use the other $2 million to make other movies. And Charles Band is seeing all of this done by Corman, by Canon. He's like, hey, uh, I can do that. And then that's where the empire that you mentioned, Nick, kind of comes in. He's like, hey, I'm going to create my own thing called Empire. Uh, interesting how all these roads cross over and make these movies cross our paths that have connections to other sometimes better movies, but then seeing something like Gremlins, something that's for sure in, in our DNA of having grown up and remember always people being like, oh, well, it's kind of a like Ghoulies kind of copied it. <laughs> but then you read like, oh, shit, like Band made Ghoulies before Gremlins came out. And that was the movie that banked them a shit ton of money that allowed them to make a ton of other movies that allowed them to to make Full Moon. Again, something that's interesting to me uh, in kind of like piecing all of this together when you kind of see all the politics, all the machinations and all this stuff, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Well, no, it is cool because, you know, through all the behind the scenes connectivity and everything, it is. It's seriously, it's proto-globalization. You know, it's certainly more interesting than the movie that we're avoiding talking about. But simply, oh. sorry, Nick, please continue. <laughs> you know, I, I, we said it a couple times, you know, I, I will hold any movie in somewhat respect that just by sheer existing, because movies are the one ultimate art form that you really can't do by yourself. Asterisk, I know you can probably do something digitally. But, when, but you know, the fact that a movie even exists through financial woes, uh, scrupulous distributors, other actors or whatnot... And especially when you have this interconnected of who's doing what, where, when with this company back can deals or whatever. So, you know, Parasite is one of those films that, you know, by sheer existence, I do applaud it. I feel like I'm being too hard on it. I wanted to like it. It, it has it has so many good ideas. You know what? You know what? This this is time what you said. Let's we make three million dollars and spend one million of it to make a movie. That's Parasite. In this case, just to be, they did spend only 800000 Okay, so <laughs> even more so, they. Sk I think Parasite's big problem is, b big idea, not necessarily small budget, because, you know, I brought up at the beginning of this podcast, a uh, movie Deadly Spawn, that there's like shot from shots in Parasite that I've seen in Deadly Spawn, like when the one of the spawns like explodes out of a person's face toward the camera, that's, that's in Parasite, but it's just done better in Deadly Spawn, even though Deadly Spawn's not 3D. There's a scene where uh, Demi Moore gets beat up. Uh, the main doctor, who looks like a Jeff Goldblum knockoff, revives her. And then <laughs> he takes off. He just takes off. And then he comes back 10 minutes later. And he's like, I know how to kill a parasite. High frequencies. That, that's it. It's That's what this movie has, is these moments of there's no logic, no, how did you get to that point B? You weren't even at a point A. You just disappeared off screen and came back from it. There wasn't even a scene of, Maybe you're walking by a, a stream and the wrestling water caused your stomach to churn and you had an aha Newton's apple moment or something. There is none of that. There's another scene. And shortly after that scene, what do they do? They drive back to the hostel they're staying at. They run in and run out. Well, you've got the main villain, the, the merchant in his black Lamborghini. His car's parked right in front of him. Right in front of them. And they don't react to it. They're not like, Oh my God, the bad guy is here. Maybe we should... No, they run in, grab their stuff and leave. And You, for, you forget, Nick, that an uh, 80s Lamborghini Countach just kind of melds into the desert landscape. So it wouldn't be very obvious. But no, it's parked right next to their hostel. And I'm like, the bad guy's right there. He's right in front of you. But why aren't you reacting to that? You know, so that's what I think. When, you, when you're so low budget that you don't... When you're making up stuff on the fly or you're just kind of winging it or going with it or your script is incomplete... You have those kind of moments of, well, we'll edit this later or fix it later or just skip it. Movies going quick enough. Audiences won't have enough time to dwell on it. That's what I think this movie suffers from. Unfortunately, it didn't have any of the Pat, the Charles band aids, as you joked earlier, to cover those up. 
I think if it had smoothed that type of stuff out, you would have had a pretty solid monster flick that even though they don't show the monster that much, you would still have like I, I brought up The Fly earlier. This movie's very much like The Fly, you know, aside from the guy looking like uh, Jeff Goldblum, you know, Jeff Goldblum is doing the tests on himself, like you do when you're a mad scientist. This guy has a parasite on himself. He's trying to basically do the tests and stuff on himself. Um, So you have that, you know, mystery or, or weird science going. You could play off all that. And this movie just doesn't do it. And it it should have. It, the, the tools are right there. You had all the cool stuff. Why didn't you assemble the movie Legos better? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think there are scenes also that that kind of drag, mm-hmm. and so it, it it just feels for a movie that I don't remember the the actual length. It's not a very long movie, but it feels padded. But at the same time, like you're saying, Nick, like just some basic story structure is like just dropped and, and missed. But when one of the characters, uh, I think his, his name, his character's name is Zeke. Is played yeah. by a guy Tom Villard, who, if if you've seen the movie or if you've seen him, was I won't say he was all over like eighties movies and TV, but he was in a lot of stuff. And, yes. and chances are you will you will have seen him from from somewhere. You know, he gets infected with with the parasite, and it's just kind of like this. He's like laid up, and you, you know, you've got like the sheet on him, and the parasites. It, 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 but it's just like interminable. Like you're waiting for something to happen, and it just kind of like drags. And drags and like maybe we go we cut to another scene and it's just kind of like where is this all leading to and I feel like it's just it's too disjointed so that you're not really following what's going on other than the overall story you kind of get but it's just again it's just not very interesting and so if you don't have like some of those like just bonkers moments that are going to really grab hold of you like Metal Storm the Destruction of Jared <laughs> Sitton when the cyborg's arm comes out. And starts shooting like the green acid at the screen where it's like, okay, well, this movie is is really kind of silly, but that's something that stays in your head. There's nothing in Parasite really that is the equivalent of that. And so if you're boring me, then it's, you know, it, it's hard for me to care. Like, and and so like the longer that a scene goes on where it's not really seeming like it's going anywhere, the more I'm starting to like, what else do I, you know, uh, what else do I have to do? Or is there a book that I should be reading? Should I be doing something else? <laughs> Yeah. And that doesn't happen very often uh, with me, but it, you know, it did with this film. So it's the same writer of both movies, too, Pete, because uh, the right. same writer who wrote Parasite, uh, Alan Adler, wrote Metal Storm: The Destruction of Jared Sin. And we were talking about Metal Storm. You know, it probably comes in at like around ninety minutes, mm-hmm. and about thirty minutes of that is just driving. So <laughs> yeah. if you yeah. took out a chunk, it would be like maybe a good TV pilot. That I mean, like it would be a really fun TV pilot in the spirit of like Jason of Star Command or, or something along those lines, you can feel the drag, like you said, in some of these scenes that could have felt tighter. Uh, you know, maybe this could have been like a good 40-some minute uh, Tales from the Dark Side or Tales from the Crypt Ooh. episode. Then you would have a little bit more intensity. I wouldn't say it would be memorable, but it would have made for a more enjoyable viewing experience. I am like the post-apocalyptic setting because, again, it's a site we're talking about... Uh, you know, this is a 3D movie that came out during that wave of 3D movies in the early 80s. But I kind of consider it a lesser entry of the post-Mad Max, uh, post-apocalyptic films that came out in the early 80s. You know, there's a very little bit of DNA of, like, Escape from New York in here, for instance. Why not? I appreciate it. But again, if you didn't put in post-apocalyptic, would it have the same bearing on the plot? No, you could have had this in normal times. Uh you know, scientist takes off and corporate people are out to get him. I mean, it's really, we've seen that plot a million times. So to me, it's nice backdrop. Is it needed? No. A lot of other characters, like they don't add anything to the, even Demi Moore's character. She doesn't do anything. Uh, speaking of things, not even doing anything, the, the climactic ending where, you know, they have the, uh, the radio instrument or whatnot, and they turn it up and the parasite bursts from the guy's stomach. That's mm-hmm. The funny thing is the staircase right above them is where parasite number two is. And apparently that one doesn't hear the, uh, you know, uh, sound go off or anything. It's completely on face. I'm like, you're right there. How come you're not dying as well? That's again, more of these weird, I don't want to call them logic leaps because, you know, you can suspend your disbelief, but they are, they're glaring things right there that again, you could have sued down. 
I had some notes, and then I'll just go through some of the notes quickly. So it's <laughs> getting to refresh my memory, Bernie. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, no, fair enough, fair enough. So the post-apocalyptic thing, again, it, it was kind of lost on me because they, they do sprinkle, at one point, one of the folks in there mentions sickies. So it kind of alludes to maybe there was a, a sickness or, or a pandemic or something that mm-hmm. may have affected or, you know, or, or been impacted by the this post-apocalyptic wasteland. They talk about suburban uh, work camps. Oh, yeah. It seems like they have kids, not like not only so much like work camps, but they tattoo the kids or like brand them. And one of the main characters, uh, the leader of the gang, who looks a lot like John Glover, and I really had to look to make sure it wasn't <laughs> John Glover. He has a tattoo and he's obviously still scarred by, you know, his experience in that work camp. So there's kind of this allusion to that. They have a laser. Uh, I mean, the the guy merchant who's the bounty hunter that you mentioned earlier, Nick, he has like a pen laser of some type. But early in the movie, like the main professor, the mad scientist guy, he has a laser gun as well. So it seems like there's like all these little sprinkles of things that never really go anywhere and aren't really necessary. And tr- you could tell they're trying. They're trying to add something to a movie and it doesn't always work. I do think the parasite the creature effects are legit scary i mean you know they're like seems like early stan winston they don't always stick the landing sometimes they have that sort of puppet deadly spawn feel that you mentioned nick but there's some times where especially when they're sticking on like the girl's leg it does look a little gnarly and it just you know didn't give me the double take but i was like oh well well done with like whatever you know slime or or whatever you guys use like it worked Vivian, uh, Vivian Blaine is the actress. And mind you, she was like one of the first actresses in the original Broadway version of Guys and Dolls. She's the older woman who runs the hotel, who has like this affinity for kind of being made up and reliving her youth. When she dies, and then she gets the death from above from the from the parasite. That whole scene is kind of cool. It's meant to be a bit of a jump scare. But to your point, Pete, they even slow-mo the jump scare where... Like the dummy doesn't really fully explode and it kind of takes a little bit of the bite of what they're trying to do. Um, sometimes it was difficult to figure out, Pete, like in some of the 3D movies we saw. And I think Metal Storm had some of this and sometimes it didn't. The 3D elements where yeah. in some of those movies we've seen, it's kind of hard to figure out like in Space Hunter, for, you know, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, where was the 3D? versus Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, would be like, ah, stuff in your eye. Look, stuff at the screen. Okay, yeah. obvious. This one, there's a snake in the beginning, which I have to assume was a 3D effect. The parasite at times, there's like parts with like broken glass. The the laser, I hope, was in 3D when it was there. Falling bodies, that big gas tank explosion at the very end, like towards the culmination, Nick, that you were talking about. There's some things there, but unlike Treasure of the Four Crowns, where it's gimmicky, but it's still kind of cool. This one, it doesn't, even the 3D effects aren't really that gimmicky. I would have rather they actually kind of lunge them at the screen Friday the 13th 3D style. I said the, the one the one uh, 3D effect that stood out to me, uh, the snake was was the obvious one, but then when the when the one guy gets impaled with like the pole through his stomach, Oh, and yeah. The camera kind <laughs> yeah. of does the push yeah. in on it and you're waiting for it and, you know, and it delivers like all of a sudden, like the blood just starts dripping out of like the, you know, because it's a it's a hollow pole, metal pole that's stuck through. And so it was like, like, OK, you know, there it is. But I and I don't know if either of you know this, but we had this discussion, Bernie, when we were talking about Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, which and Space Hunter, which I believe both of those were originally filmed to not be in 3D and oh, yeah. were being kind of retrofitted to you know, take advantage of of the of that mini boom. So I don't know if the same thing was going on here where they're like, oh, well, we just need a couple of like obvious 3D shots. And so that's how some of that got in there. I don't know if you if you in your research from what I from what I read, it seems like they deliberately made it as a 3D movie. Like it wasn't uh an afterthought or I think it was in uh Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, if I remember right, in Space Hunter, where the studio gave them some money to kind of retrofit it, like you were saying, yeah. Pete. And yeah. at times it, it's obvious, and other times it's it makes the 3D effects less obvious. This one, at least again, from what I found, seems like Charles Band was like, oh, look, coming at you is making money, and it's in 3D. Thus, I will make a movie in 3D that will also make money. It was shot with 3D in mind. I remember sitting through the credits, and it's sitting out, listing all the studios and camera operators and stuff, and it was listening to... The 3D uh, camera. You, you got through the credits, Nick? I mean, oh. bravo. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I'm one of those folks. I I've got to set to the credits. Those people made the movie. They deserve my attention. And you know, as a side note, this is kind of a holdover of you know living in California for ten plus years and just meeting a lot of people who do work on movies sure. that. We, we do make the, we'll watch, you know, Star Wars on the big screen and we'll wait for like the ADR section to come up. Like, oh, we know that guy. It's, you know, it's just kind of cool. But um, I, I do have to say that the snake sequence, because the hero is rolling around with a sickie. Although, side note, that that everything before that seems weird because there's two of them sexually molesting a, a lady and he's trying to save them. And it turns out she was, that's her kink, I guess. That's all awkward, but, you know, that's exploitation for you. But, you know, they're rolling around in this, you know, the snake howls right toward the camera. I kind of saw that was clever because they recreate that scene at the very end with the parasite. He's rolling around with the merchant and there's the parasite in front of him. One just for the camera and takes the guy. So I, I'm a sucker for book ending things or slash subtle foreshadowing. Like, oh, they did it at the beginning of the film and now they're doing it at the end of the film. I like that. It, it makes things nice and tidy. Ladies and gentlemen, you just saw Nick attempt to put together a narrative loop <laughs> in a movie that seemed to lose a lot of narrative along the way. How, how can a movie that takes place in a ghost town that has like five people living in it suffer from a problem of, where's this guy? Where's that guy? I got to find this guy. Tell me where that guy is. Tell me where that lady is. I got to go find him. 50% of the film is people can't finding other people <laughs> in this town that's deserted and has three buildings. Barely, you just need to park your Lamborghini out front and just wait because people will just come along. Then you just, just <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, just just drive around a Lamborghini Countach around the desert, and I'm sure it'll get great mileage and will have no issues whatsoever because that's what it was built. I, I know, I know, gas is very expensive in this world, but like, just leave it idling, and you know, Demi Moore and uh, Dr. Paul Dean will be along presently for you to uh, try to apprehend. I don't usually look at trivia, but I did look at the trivia of this film. And apparently there was supposed to be a sequel yes. that didn't happen. And I would like to think the sequel would have been Demi Moore and Jeff Goldblum, or Jeff Goldblum knockoff, getting into that Lamborghini, because that's their car now, and driving around having adventures. Before we end it, because yeah. you know, Nick and I like our music, I will say that there's some interesting trivia musically to this film, but Demi Moore's last name comes from her marriage to a musician named Freddie Moore, who's actually in this film. Oh, he's Arn. And uh, Arn and Demi wrote, co-wrote a song. He had a band called the New Cats, N-U-K-A-T-S in the 80s. Uh, he wrote this song called It's Not a Rumor, which was not a hit, but it did get some MTV airplay back in the days when insert joke here, MTV played music videos. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then also in this movie is Sherry Curry, who was in the band The Runaways. And if you know uh, the song Carrie Bomb was probably one of their biggest hits uh, in the band with Joan Jett and Lita mm -hmm. Ford, who went on to have uh, very successful careers. So you've got like this weird uh, early 80s uh, music element uh, to it as well. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated how they got all of those people involved. I, I think I read that Sherry Curry did not want to partake in this and then convinced the writers to be like, if you give me more lines and better dialogue, I'll do it. And so they said, okay, yes. And then they just cut out all the extra lines that they wrote for it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Well, on top of all that, uh, you get Robert Band, uh, who's Rich, uh, Richard. Charles, Rich, Richard Band, who's Charles's brother, who's done uh, the score on a lot of these films. That it, hey, uh, they keep it in the family, so you, you got to give them some credit for that. It's it's sad that, uh, well, maybe it's not so sad after this conversation, if you've been listening this far, that there wasn't a part two, but ultimately because of the collapse of Embassy that produced this, that also, connecting the dots, Nick, you mentioned uh, you found some escape from New York elements to this movie. What they are, no one knows. But nevertheless, Embassy did produce, actually, uh, both films, along with like The Fog, The Graduate, actually a, a ton of other movies. Uh, this is Spinal Tap, The Producers, but then Embassy Collapsed. I believe it was owned by Erwin Yablon. So I guess if you know if there's any cosmic karma after forcing out Band from media, home video, you know, uh, Embassy falling apart uh, also doesn't allow us to get Parasite 2 that they weren't able to make. Nevertheless, for, for a movie that had the tagline, uh, you will not feel the terror until you experience the movie. 
we we experienced the movie, but we did not do it. Terror. Terror. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate a good tagline. And once it gets inside you, you will do anything to get out. I think that's we just really want to get out of this conversation about the movie <laughs> Parasite 3D. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And that was Parasite. <laughs>